Hey guys, this is going to be a different type of video, so it's going to be on psychological conditioning, but it's going to be a new type of format of video so that I can basically, I want to reach out and find new ways to teach, better ways to teach. So I'm testing this method. Also, this will be a cheaper way to create videos, and I'm thinking of creating a couple courses, so I want you guys' feedback on that. So I want you guys' feedback on a $47 psychology video course. So the MVP, MVPs are very valuable, basically minimal viable product where it's only 12 videos at the very beginning, but eventually I will add up to 30 videos. And these videos will include stuff like parts of the brain, famous psychologists, stuff about personalities, psychosexual stages, depression, therapies, attachment theory, all kinds of other psychology stuff. But if you would please just click on the little thing on the right side of the YouTube video and take my poll if you would buy this course or not. Also, I've been thinking about a practical psychology course where it would include everything in the basic psychology course, but it would also include all kinds of psychological experiments, psychological effects, at least 25 videos on cognitive bias, and 30 videos on logical fallacies where I would give you guys examples, what they are, and how to manipulate them in marketing or how to get people to like you and stuff like that. It will also include all kinds of cool stuff like body language, social psychology, evolutionary psychology, dating tips, even psychology on production, and maybe a little bit on self-improvement. So this is a second poll. Just leave your little answer up there if you would or you wouldn't buy a $297 course that would include all of this stuff. So on to conditioning. There are two types of conditioning. The first one we're going to talk about is classical conditioning. Now classical conditioning is a type of learning procedure in which a biologically required stimulus, such as food or sex, is paired with a previously neutral stimulus, something neutral like a plate or a bed. Eventually, when you pair these two things together, the secondary stimulus will produce a response similar to the primary stimulus. So here's an example. This guy named Ivan Pavlov, he's a Russian psychologist and he performed the famous Pavlov dog experiment. So if you look here on number one, they gave food to the dog and he, I think he drilled into the dog's cheeks and found a way to measure if the dogs would salivate, if they would make spit. And eventually, after showing them enough food, they would. The second thing, if you move on to number two, is that he rang a bell and he realized the dogs did not salivate. And this is the conditioned response on the neutral stimulus. The stimulus is the bell, and the response is the dog is not salivating. So if we move on to number three, you see the bell and the food together. And eventually, the dog learns, hey, there's food, I'm going to salivate. And it associates the food with the bell. Now, it, sometimes it takes 10 iterations, sometimes it takes 100, but this condition is called pairing. And if we look on to number four, eventually you can remove the food and the dog will start to salivate because its brain will pair the bell and the food together. And when it sees the food and when it hears the bell, it will remember that food is coming and start to salivate. And this is called classical conditioning. So here are some technical terms. The unconditioned stimuli is the dog food and the unconditioned response is the dog's mouth watering. Now, if we look underneath that, the conditioned response, what we want to pair it with is the metronome or the bell. And the conditioned response, usually the conditioned response is the exact same as the unconditioned response. You can see where I've bolded both of those. Dog's mouth watering, they're the same thing. But the stimuli are different. Now, this is called pairing. So the equation is if we mix something unconditional with something conditional, eventually we'll get the conditioned response. So if we mix the two underlined things, eventually we'll come up with the bold thing. So here's another example. There's this guy and he has his girlfriend and his girlfriend loves to eat onions. Well, the guy kisses his girlfriend and the girlfriend has onion breath. Eventually, the guy gets aroused, psychologically and sexually aroused from kissing his girlfriend and he associates that onion breath as something sexually attractive or sexy. So now we can go through the same terms again so that you guys can understand it better. The unconditioned stimuli was kissing, and that leads to the unconditioned response of sexual arousal. And the conditioned stimuli, the thing that you pair it with, is onion breath, and the conditioned response is the same. So the other type of conditioning is something a little bit newer. It's called operant conditioning. And this is a type of learning in which the strength of a behavior is modified by the consequences. So you guys might know some of these terms, but usually they're messed up. In fact, my early version of Habit Harvester, I mix these terms up. So there's positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, and there's also positive and negative punishment. So the positive negative part means to add or remove a stimulus. Positive means to add a stimulus and negative means to remove a stimulus. And then there's also the reinforcement and punishment part. The reinforcement part means to create a behavior, and the punishment part means to remove a behavior. So if we put these together, we can come up with positive reinforcement, which is adding a stimulus to create a behavior. 
Something like if you put gummy bears on your textbook and after each paragraph that you read, you get to eat the gummy bear. It's going to increase the frequency of that behavior of reading the paragraphs. This is called positive reinforcement. Now, negative reinforcement, a lot of people get this confused with positive reinforcement. It occurs when a behavior is followed by the removal of a stimulus. Something when you remove a stimulus to add behavior, something like if you don't finish your work by Friday, you have to work on Saturday. By adding that aversive stimulus, something that someone wants to avoid on Saturday, they will increase their behavior on Friday. So they're removing the stimulus of working on Saturday by increasing the behavior on Friday. That's called negative reinforcement. If I don't explain this as well, please leave a comment below and I'll try to work better on that. Positive punishment. Now this occurs when a behavior is followed by an aversive stimulus, such as pain. So this is when you add a stimulus, usually a negative stimulus, to remove behavior. For example, whenever you have a bad habit, maybe say you say a swear word that you're trying to remove that habit or you're trying to stop smoking, whenever you go outside you can put a rubber band on your wrist and snap that rubber band. And it, it's not going to become detrimental to your health, but it will hurt. And after a while, your brain will start to rewire itself to decrease that behavior. And on to negative punishment, this occurs when a behavior is followed by the removal of a stimulus to decrease the behavior. Remember, punishment is about decreasing the behavior. So, removing a stimulus to remove the behavior. For example, if you remove the money part of a job, people will also remove the behavior part. They'll stop going to work. Most people. And there's also something called extinction, and this is available in both operant and classical conditioning. So for operant, it would be how long after the stimulus is either added or removed does the behavior stop or continue, depending on what type of conditioning you're doing before it was formed. Now in classical conditioning, or pairing, it's basically saying how many times do you have to ring the bell before the dog figures out that there's no food, or does the pairing disappear? Now I found out many anxiety disorders and fears are formed from the brain not being able to remove extinction. For example, fear of heights. Now we can actually reasonably be safe in buildings that are high up off the ground or airplanes, but we still have that fear of heights because the extinction hasn't left our brain. Because the because the conditioning has not left our brain. The same with fear of spiders. We can know and look at a spider and know that it's not going to bite us, that it has been trained not to bite us. We can also look at it and say that's not a venomous spider. But we can still be afraid of them. The same with people. The fear of people is usually associated with a lower social status, that if we do something and we talk to people, they will push us down the social ladder. But actually, it usually takes a lot of active work to get someone to actively hate you. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave a like. If you didn't, please click the dislike. And please leave a comment below of what you thought of this new style. Thanks for watching and subscribe for more.